morning. Well, uh, my name is Thomas. For the past three flipping years, I've been residing here in Red Lion, Pennsylvania. Uh, but anyway, here I reside. I had a lovely field, gorgeous field, and just recently I got all my crops I had in storage. And currently they're they're being planted in the field. Methuselah was still a teenager. It's been the last time the stuff has been out and I can go, oh yeah, buckaroo. I remember where we were when we got that. Flipping yeah. I'm gonna mention him a lot. His name is Buckaroo and he's my puka. I would want to spell it. You can Google it, you probably get a thousand and one whatever. I, I, I like the definition. Uh, in his book, it simply states a mystical being, a malevolent mystical being that helps humankind. Um, I have known him my entire life. And if he did not enter my life in, the, in August of 79, I would not be talking to you. But we'll have to discuss Buckaroo later. Back to my field. I am a collector, and I have been collecting since I was a kid. And I said, oh shit, what a cool flipping rock that is. When I bugged out of Mr. Rizzo's house, I filled up a cigar box with rocks. That box, cigar box, contains stones I, I left with when I bugged out of Newburgh. <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, I'm walking. Get right in the fucking road. I, I, you'll need me. They speak to you. I'm sorry. I've got the stones to prove it. On my flipping travels, I find this right in my path. And the fucking thing says, hey, Ed, you're looking for this for Ed. Pick it up. Goes in the pocket. When I was in Newburgh, the three years I lived with Mr. Rizzo, once, once a week I left my, my self-induced depression and left the hole that I dug my and tricked myself in because I had to get food for the hole. You gotta eat. Even though you don't feel you want to die, you have to eat. So, in that, in that day, again, walking on the street, I find another fucking stone. Hey, Ed will use this. Shit. Uh, when, when did we start collecting, Buckaroo? Oh, you know what? I can tell you the exact fucking date. I can the exact fucking date I started collecting stones. I've been collecting, st uh, collecting stones since, since uh, 012 of March. In this pile are stones that I collected for that ledge of the Pacific stones. That's one, that one I bought at, at a pawn shop. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was like a dollar fifty. It was a box of them. You wanted a buck fifty. The few times that I had access to television, that was my sister's house. And the FX ch uh, channel had just come on the air. And that first season, they had a collectible show, which was a 30-minute long show. And it told me that Barbies, the first Barbies were ugly pigs, were worth 500 to 1,000 of dollars, depending on the Barbie. And are you shitting me? A doll that Ma spent, what was it, five bucks back in whenever it was? In 68, in the early 60s? Is now worth flipping 500 fucking dollars for a doll? They're bad for you. When I lived with Mr. Rizzo, my brother in Newburgh, he had a fucking widescreen TV with thick fucking surround sound. It was like being in a fucking movie theater. And that's all I did.
they're even worse than a fucking TV. Those kind of computers gonna lead us all to hell. I I read. I will I will go to the library and I will check out a bunch of books and I will come home and I will read them. I went to the library when it was open and I checked out uh, six or five, five or six books. And I have them home and I have no desire to read anything. But no, the Botanica was the first things that I read or, or felt like reading forever. Yes. I, I think it was just, I, I'm starting with, with the letter A, and I've been flipping and reading. Radio is always on. And they play music. And the radio, I, I, I grew up hearing music. Depending on where you were in the house, there was radio always playing. My employer's name is Edward Eddington. I've been employed by him since the early 90s when I had a trailer, I had a dresser. And shit started to appear on top of the dresser. Besides the main field, which, which is uh, in construction, Mr. Eddington has three auxiliary fields. Life, hearth and home, and war. What the three fields represent is 30 years of collecting. I'm now organizing, organizing um, where it all begins concerning Ed's, which is auxiliary field one, which is hearth and home. And see, I'm really upset because I, I really want to place the bears, but the bears weren't fucking cooperating. So you went down in the shell. So if you cooperate, you'll be in the field because you need to be in the field. So now cooperate. Buckaroo said where to place you, so we're gonna listen to Buckaroo. Thank you, Pink Bear. You see him, you see how he's sitting pretty? Brown Bear, you do the same thing. And you're gonna go right next to him, okay? Did you notice field one? Field one's up and running. Let's go see field one. <clears throat> As you know, all three of Mr. Eddington's auxiliary fields have, have titles. The first one is life. And to the best of Mr. Eddington's ability, we have displayed life. It was the first field that came into being. So, that's why Ed called it life, because it represents every aspect of human life. Oh, he also purchased a new car. I even forgot to see what the hell it was. God, I can't read my brain anymore. That's why God, as infinite wisdom, had people in Bitcoin for glasses. And it's a Lotus, a Lotus Eporia special. That's what this new car of Ed's is. A Lotus Emporia special. Over in field one, you have an automaton. The purple guy looks like a beaver. His name is Iggy. And he runs the power grid for that field. You got the solar panels in the back and the uh, transponder behind the dinosaurs. When I moved in, people that lived there was a single ma and uh, I think the boy was like uh, eight or nine. So he left a whole big gallon jar 
I don't think the little boy intended to leave them, but they were left behind anyway. So that's where the dinosaurs came from. Going to the library, there was a box, and inside the box were animals. This was one of them. I was going to put him with the menagerie in a field too, but Bruce said paint him red and put him in field one. So in honor of where I live, which is Red Lion, Pennsylvania, the final piece of field one, which is, according to the sign, life. Well, I think, I think me and Ed had done a pretty good job uh, representing life. on all forms of life. The flag was Dad's flag, in case he was in the Army. Ma didn't want it, my big brother didn't want it, so they gave it to me. But on the shelf is a family portrait. Somebody's wedding, I don't remember whose. All the things on that shelf was stuff made, made by my Ma for Christmas. So, I decided to collect stuffies and dolls. Those are my stuffies that I got from church and I found. The rest is just my collections. It has one main field which is in my bedroom. And he has three auxiliaries. This is all auxiliary field too. Which according to the sign is hearth and home. Like the animals, the animals were found. Some were bought. Some came with trucks or cars, believe it or not. It was it was it was a box set. You got a whole you got a whole farm scene. The only piece I bought besides the cars was that brass horse in the back. The spotted pony believes the brass horse is its ma. Even though the brass horse is a male, Spotted Pony is devoted to it, which is why it's always at its shadow. The tractor on there is a Ford. The thing driving it is Bob, and Bob is an automaton. You program Bob, and Bob will just, he'll just drive until the tractor goes out of gas. So Bob can go 24-7, which uh, allows the human farmer um, to do other things. Life sleep, spend time with his family. And he's got the cows, the sheep, the goats. The calf was all happy that for the next six months he was gonna be fed the best grain, the best grass. He was gonna be massaged every afternoon. So the goat asks the kid, well, what happens to you after after the six months? And he says, "Oh, I, I get turned I get turned out into pasture." And the ghost says, "Oh, you get turned out into pasture, all right. But ain't the pasture you're thinking about, kid? What do you mean? You'll be dead, kid. The humans are gonna skin you, cut you, and and cook you up because your flesh." is very pricey. Your flesh, the humans call veal. And the humans pay top dollar for veal. So, you can imagine this kid now has got all these questions in his head. So he's running to his dad because who else would know but his dad? He says, Dad, is it true? Is it true? What? He says, the humans are going to eat me in six months? He looks over at the kid. He says, yeah, that's about the size of it, son. Dead? Yeah, but son, think about it. You're going to have six months of the best grain you'd ever want to eat. Air conditioning, son. You know how hot it's going to get here in the fields? You'll be better than the pig, son. And you'll live better than a pig. No one. But Pa, I'm going to be dead. But son, no one knows 
what's after death. Why worry about it? We live here on the good earth, and the good earth is all about life, and it is about death. And who knows, son? Maybe you'll come back as a toad. Now, run along and go play. So that's the story with the barred animals. I was helping a guy move, and he had a bunch of um, uh, fireplace tools, you know, the poker and the rake, and he was he was giving them to salvage. The poker had the owl. So I says, can I please have this? And he says, sure. So I unscrewed it, and there we go. But uh, Mr. Eddington suffered a major disaster on field two this afternoon. This glass sat with the other three. And all of these glasses were on the edge of the refrigerator, not far, but I didn't realize vibration. With every step, the things move. <laughs> I just closed the door, and there was a flipping crash. I, I wish to God we could have got that on film. I, I, I believe I believe the fucking thing actually, actually just just it just slid off, and it flipping hovered. Now, this glass, which had water up till there, the glass fell. But it fell straight down. So now I got this glass and I went to several stores looking to find a pheasant. You know pheasant under glass? Didn't find a pheasant. So when I went through Ed's main shelf bin, I found one chick. This glass is going to be incorporated somewhere in Ed's in the field because it, it belongs. But I just thought I'd share that with you and get it on film. Again, hearth and, uh, hearth and home has hearth and home. And simple. And I think Mr. Eddington uh, has displayed hearth and home pretty well. And uh, if, if anybody else disagrees, blank them. <laughs> Mr. Eddington is not in the business for people. Mr. Eddington is the business of selling cars. And collecting and displaying odds and ends, obviously. The War Room is dedicated to my godfather, William Gaudioso, who in 1968 had a room in his basement that was his war room. And uh, my godfather had um, Along his walls, all the rifles they used, all the pistols, all the hand grenades. It was a war room devoted totally to war. The man was a genius. And up, up in the ceiling, ceiling which my war, war room will have eventually, were planes, model planes of every flipping a nation that fought in the wars. Now, in his war room, in the far corner of it was a war table like mine, only Godfather used G.I. Joe's. And he built the bunkers with, with, with Pass Through Paris, the sandbags, the sandbags he made, he, he stitched them all up, made separate sandbags, and then filled each one with sand, and then sewed them. That's how detailed this man was. I did send him pictures of my field, and he said, a lot to, lot to see, but uh, it, it was a nice job. So, um, behold the sign. Balls and things on the floor. Uh, why? To keep people from, from walking next to the field. Because there, there's a tremor zone. If you pass it, shit falls. I'm going to post that where it says, uh, mind the balls. Balls knocked over. Cough up $5,000. <laughs> they were right in front of me. They were, ow, you bitch. I have to pay the house $5,000 because I knocked the ball. Well, it's my house, so I don't gotta pay shit. 
But anybody, anybody else who knocks the ball over, it's five thousand dollars they got to cop up, or else. I get a body part. Usually I take a pinky joint. I lost my train. You interrupted my train. What were we talking about? Before you, the sign says, Ed's Auxiliary Field 3, simply marked war. Ed is Mr. Eddington and he is my employer. Mr. Eddington, as you can see, is a collector. He also sells new and used cars and many odds and ends. Field 3 is one of his auxiliary fields. Mr. Rankin has three. Each of the three auxiliary fields have a theme. Field 1 is life, field 2 is heart and home, and field 3, Mr. Eddington's jewel, is simply war. And what Mr. Eddington has depicted is the last battle. What we have here is the counted, the damned, and the remaining of the faithful. We'll get to the faithful later. Let's start with the counted. Up on the dais, you have Cletus. No demon, he's a first pile demon. Now, Cletus is no different than any other legion that's on the field. But as you can see, Cletus is holding the orb of power. If you are able to control it, you can pretty much destroy anything. Right now, Cletus is hoping he will get his legion commanders stop arguing long enough to listen to him. Because that's what happened the first time around. You know, they almost won that war in the heavens. This is only the, the stage one of the battle. You see, Cletus's main objective is to get his three commanders to also hold that orb of power. And they, together, if they are successful, will bring forth something upon the field that has not been seen for tens of thousands of years. This will come into being someday. John's or Jesus wrote in his revelation to John, she was called the great whore of Babylon that comes out of the abyss. Well, in Mr. Eddington's field, she is known as the great Gorgon. She represents all the nasties, everything evil, everything hideous that our fellow Homer sapiens have done, continue to do, and do do upon their fellow Homer sapiens. Just know that if he is successful in uniting his legion and Gorgon is summoned, then the faithful which we will discuss momentarily, is flippin' doomed. The faithful side is a conglomerate of the past and the last. And as you can see, there are several key members of the faithful. You have the giants, and you have the light brigade. The light brigade Which, as you can see, it's a light brigade. It's long swords and small shields and lances and two cavalry pieces. They are here because they are, they are part of the past when the faithful stood against tyrants and won. The giants have issues. They're brothers and they're also twins. The one with the battle axe is the more saner of the group, which is why he is trying to keep his brother from wanting to kill. Now, the little girl on the podium, her name is Lorelaya. Now, Lorelaya is only six years old, but she is also an ancient. And an ancient is simply that. It is a being who has thousands of years of knowledge because they have walked the earth that long. Now, Lorelai, she levitated up onto her podium, which silenced both the uh, Light Brigade and the Giants. Now listen, when you silence a giant, you've done a good thing. She is currently addressing the Giants because she needs the Giants to understand that um, 
shit has hit the fan and they need to put, put away their grievances towards the humans. Um, the reason why they are paused like that is because she is speaking to them in High Gaelic. They haven't heard High Gaelic since their fucking grandmother spoke it. It's their church language that their, their mother taught them when they were children. And the fact that this little slip of a girl is speaking to them like she grew up with it has got their attention. She is trying to keep the peace. Surrounding her are the four remaining free range horses. They've never been rodent. It was you that told me I had four. I didn't count them, but it's really interesting that we have four. And now they're going to represent the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And they are all four stallions, which, which is unique. They should be killing each other, but they're not. That's because an ancient has them under, the, under her spell. Didn't the porters come out good? I told you I, I painted the sticks and I, the darts. The darts were from from uh, crossbow. I got I got twenty of these uh, for Christmas one year, and they are and they are bolts for a um, crossbow. No, what? I don't know why I got them for Christmas. They just. Santa was just funny that year anyway. Behold Draga, the last green dragon of the known age. There are five types. There is the green, there is the gray, there is the black, there is the red, and there is the white. Out of the five, the green is the most intelligent and also the most severe. Also the most difficult to make any kind of alliance with. But if you are successful in doing so, you've got an alliance that will last a millennium. And the only way it would be broken is if, the, if you break it. Dragon will deny this fact, but uh, the humans are interesting. As many, as many millennia as Dragon has been around, she has found the humans to be the most interesting species of all she has encountered. For they are so quick to love, they are so quick for joyous, beautiful things. You can also see that the four horses are rather agitated. They're agitated because, well, Draga has arrived. And uh, Draga is a dragon. She's an alpha predator. Guess what dragons eat? Horses, among other things. You see, you see that square? That's where the wizard goes. I had it with my fucking hand, and and he wobbled, and I grabbed it, and, he, and bam! I'm gonna cry. I'm going to fucking cry. Yeah, and he broke his arm again. Oh no! If we listen to my fucking puka. She'd be on the fucking field where she belongs. So now, now I'm upset that I didn't listen to Buckaroo, and I'm gonna have to do this. But once it's fucking done, and I put her on the field, she's done. Now, this spell up here, his name is Spiritual Thaddeus Andrew sees Mortimer Smith. And he is the last alive free thinking man. Trying to coax a uh, green dragon into an alliance. There are several droids that the faithful revamped. Beep Beep is one of the many droids that the faithful have brought back online. Now, peace small for his size, but you see the see the iron wood next to the pyre, each one of those planks weighs 10,000 pounds. Beep Beep can lift it up, lift those no problem. The Great Gorgon, 
she has entered the field, but she has not engaged it. Now, her power comes from deception. Deception of the feminine kind. She is a master of feminine de deception. The faithful have a defense against her, and they're the last remaining virgins. These maidens were very powerful in the fact that they were 100% true Wicca, and they lived by the codes of the Wicca, which is the codes of mother and love and joy and earth. The prefect, now there is nothing major about her. It's what she's holding that makes her who she is. What she's holding is a lightning staff. She will be able to throw it one time. And even if her throw is off, if she is thinking here and thinking here of the target, wherever that target is on the field, the lance will find its target. The power will be left. And the droids will be activated and hopefully they will return with, with reports of other fires being sighted. But you see, you have to keep the fire going indefinitely, maybe. The faithful are hoping that other fires have been seen, which means that other dragons have come to the aid of the humans. Um, the reason why this pyre has not been lit yet is because Draga and Virgil are still negotiating. And the negotiations can go on for days, um, maybe even months. Which is what Virgil is trying to, uh, trying to iterate with the dragon. There's not time. There is, we're at peril. But you see, dragon doesn't care about peril. Dragon does not care that Gorgana has engaged the field. Or that a legion of first file is about to consume the last of the faithful humans. She doesn't give a shit. Right now, her only, her only interest is what Virgil is holding. And Virgil is holding something very powerful. It's a protection orb. Once activated, it will protect an area of 1.2 miles wide and thick. If you notice, Draga is also pregnant. She will not put her eggs anywhere unless that area is totally and completely secured and protected, which is why She's interested in what Virgil has to say. So that's about the size of the war right now. The dragon's talking to the human and the human's talking to the dragon. The fact that they're talking is a blessing. Oh, you also have Lorelia still negotiating agreements with the, with the giants and the light brigade and the horses. Anybody else? Anybody else the Giants would have eaten by now, or the Legion would have eaten, or the horse trampled. Meanwhile, the faithful, the faithful continue to fight. And they will fight to the last breath. And with that last breath, they will drive a sword, a spear, a piece of sharp metal, whatever they've got, they will drive it into the cold, dank heart of the counted and say, be damned, go to hell. I will not join you. I tell you, when this war goes down, it's gonna be a bitch of a one. Oh, oh I, should, I should also um, say that um, my puka buckaroo um, helped immensely with, 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 with the field. All of his ideas, the border, Dragus Mountain, um, bringing out the, the, the demons, the whole concept was all Buckaroo's idea. And my, my Pookie is very rarely wrong. Have we discussed Buckaroo? I wouldn't be on this fucking porch without my Pookie. I'd be flipping dead. Simple as that. Because when push came to shove, and I was standing on the precipice of the, on the ledge, ready to jump, it wasn't Jesus to save me. 
It wasn't. An, it wasn't a guardian angel. It wasn't a spirit. It was a puka, and his name was Bakarev. In the summer of '79, I found myself about 20 miles north of Portland, Oregon. Sitting on a moldy couch, resting the blade of my buck knife on this wrist. And as I brought it down and I could just see it cutting into the dead skin layers, I heard a fucking voice in my head. I heard that voice as clearly as I hear you talking, I hear that truck moving. I also heard it in the corner of my being. Very loud voice it was that day. And the voice said this. It said, you asshole. You're gonna kill yourself because a fucking whore doesn't love you? You're a fucking fool. Get to a phone, call your big brother, get on home. That's what I did. The things you run away from are waiting for you when you get there only are seven times worse, according to what they say. Things that work good at home. So much so that for a second time in my life, I'm on that fucking ledge again. Only this time I'm now in the downstairs bathroom of my daddy's house. Resting my chin on a loaded 12 gauge. At that moment, it's the very first time in my adult life that I actually prayed to God. My prayer was simple. It says, God, I do not want to die. If it be your will, get me out of this hell. You know what? God heard that prayer. Because moments after I prayed it, the door busted in, Big Brother rushed in, pinned me against the wall and grabbed the shotgun and there was the end of that. But time moves on. My dad dies out of the blue. Healthy one minute, dead the next. Really sucked. I was working in a restaurant at the uh, at the mall. Restaurant closes at ten, and everybody fucking scattered. <laughs> and there I am. I had this fucking pot that some brainiac scorched milk and cheese and didn't fucking pre-soak. And this effing pot I scrubbed, soaked, and it was still not clean. And I'm, gr and I'm just I'm about ready to throw this pot across the floor, kitchen, and lose another job because of my stupid anger. Behind me, I, I feel a presence and I turn around and the whole half of the other side of the kitchen has this aura, big, uka large, it was just blinding arc iridescent light. And from the core of it stepped a nine-year-old boy. Dark black hair, the eyes. The eyes were black and I looked in them briefly and saw all the worlds that ever were, all the worlds that ever could be, and I said, holy fucking shit. And I still got my hand in the fucking pot. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm staring at this shit. I know I'm seeing it. And no, I wasn't on drugs, thank you very much. I was seeing this. And he looks over, you know, it's only a pot. And he says, put it to soak. If that pot's all the thing you got left, Wash what you can and go home. I says, who the fuck are you? He says, I'm Buckaroo, and I'm a Puka. He says, no fucking way. And he says, I've been with you your whole fucking life. He disappears in the back of the prep area. But I had his voice. The same voice that spoke to me in 79. So that's how Buckaroo made his presence known to me. We're finally going to discuss Ed's main field. Do 
Do you realize the main field has not been in existence for at least 15 years? And the fact that I have a main field is because the spec room told me what to do. The field's empty, and now me and Mr. Eddington and Buckaroo are going to create the last field. But this by far is my favorite field, and Mr. Eddington's. I sat there this morning after I set everything up and, and leaned against the dresser and said, Flippin' A, Buckaroo, Ed's main field. I guess we should start from the beginning, yes? Most of the main field was there when he arrived. It took him better than five years to sort it all out. And all of this is what he found in the sheds along the north ridge of the property. It's a, pretty much of a, a ravine that, that dips right down in the river. So Ed was looking at this ravine and he saw there was a ledge above the ravine. And if he widened that ledge, you could race two cars side by side. The 525 is a straight shot, two and a quarter miles long. First one over wins. End of story. Ed Ress race for picks or $50,000 cash. Ed never lost. There's no guardrails. There's the road, which was hard pan dirt, which Ed then graveled. And then there's the five foot drop off. The first weekend that Ed prompted the race, 32 cards were drug out of the ravine because that's the difference between a racer and a driver. A racer, when he or she sits behind that wheel, becomes part of that machine. And that's what the car was. It was his only woman, it was his wife, it was his lover, and sometimes he hated the bitch because she'd sit there at night and taunt him. Come on, Eddie, let's go race some demons. Go to that picture on, on the top there, by the baby picture. That's Ed's, when I lived with my brother. In Glen Rock, it was, it was twice as long as that. And now, the cheese lady on the, on, on the main field is the centerpiece of Ed's main field. The cheese lady is a dual purpose thing. There's an observatory on, on the top um, by, her, by her crown. The ground floor, he has a concession shop stand where he sells little miniatures of all the big things that he has in the main field. The cheese lady sat on my ma's kitchen table every time pasta was served, which is about every night. And when, and when Dad passed and Mom moved into an apartment, she says, Tommy, do you want the cheese lady? And I says, Ma, are you serious? Mind you, she had other children she could have gave it to, but she gave the cheese lady to me. The gold necklace, diamond necklace around the cheese lady's neck was found in the dryers. I had a job of clean dryer. Anything I found in the dryers was mine. I would go after I, sometimes I would go to the pawn guy and I'd walk out with $60 in my pocket from the gold and silver I found in the dryer. This came with a doll, one of the Spice Girls. They had the whole series. They had the whole Soul series there and Victoria, which is the Spice Girl I chose, um, I don't know, she had them, she had attitude about her. Well, the other ones just look like dolls. Victoria said, I'm the one you want, so that's what I picked. Now, we've got an uh, alien who fell in love with the Spice Girls, and Victoria is his favorite. He was cruising in space and heard their music and downloaded their latest video, and the rest is history. 
Yes, I made them for people to sit and and just uh, you know just to sit. I uh, I had I had blue paint. I had a brush, and I just I got creative. Before I go to bed, I take a walk through ends. I sit down on one of the benches and just look at all the fucking shit. And I know each piece, where it was, when I found it. And like I said, the other things are self-explanatory as to how Ed got them. Um, he heard from, he heard from someone who heard from someone. He got the phone number of, of the person, he called them up and uh, the item was delivered. All the planes in the back, Ed got from a museum. The museum was a small tight deal that just, it, it fucking lost funding. So Ed got every one of those planes for a song, as well as the, um, the uh, lunar module. Ed was in the cheese lady. He was he was uh, he was he was selling uh, concessions. During the summer, they get we get a lot of tour buses, so they got a tour bus from from China. The only the only person who spoke really good English was the tour guide. Fifty six of them converged on on the main field and started popping their Kodaks. They were pointing at the Buddha. So Ed did not speak Chinese, and they didn't speak very much English. They, admi they were admiring Ed's collection. These, these tourists were monks looking for a home for a white Buddha. Because their, their monastery was being dismantled. The steel Buddha there, um, which is known as the glorified Buddha because he has the crowns on his head that he achieved when he passed the third stage of enlightenment and made him smart, I guess. Um, that was also found by word of mouth. And I, also, I, I know I told you about the Green Buddha, how it was found in a rubble of a village. You know what? We need to go to the fucking mall. Next next month when I have money, we'll go to the mall. I need to get six more cars, and they have to be, and they all, and, they, and the thing is, I can't get any more funny cars or race cars. I need street cars. Well, the store's open now. Can you tell me the store? Something else I try to do and not have the same color car next to the same color car. It's all about a pattern. It has to be a pattern. The last weekend of every month, NASCAR shows up. The rest of the month, Ed rotates his fields. He'll sponsor sports cars one week or or uh, SUVs the next, or whatever. And the, the main field is constantly rotating. He was sponsoring um, the, the Americans and the Europeans. And he currently was in the European lot. He had just parked an Audi, and he was back into his, he was getting back into his car to get him to another car. And a taxi arrives. Fucking city taxi pulls into his main field, which is right, right, you know, a quarter mile down the road. You can see it, right? Out steps a babe. There's no other way to describe Sarah. She was, she was, she was, she was Playboy hustler. She was every man's vision of a babe. The fucking bitch gets out of the taxi, and the taxi drives off. She says, I'm, I'm in need of a car, and uh, people in town said, you're the fellow to come see. And Ed says, well, shop around, miss, and uh, follow the instructions on the windshield. 
and each car windshield gives the make of the car the year and the, and the money you have to pay for it. It didn't give the rich another thought. He, he, um, he, um, he, he, went, he went inside, he had a quick bite to eat, which was he made a peanut butter sandwich. And it just, just reaches, reaches for the refrigerator door to get a beer, and there is a fucking... Uh, and he opened the, yes, can I help you? Have a seat, because you wanted to pay cash. Now, Mr. Eddington, Mr. Eddington said, fine, which car? So Ed takes the tag, and he puts it away, he said, uh, that'll be, that'll be $22,862, please. And she drops a stack. So the bills were, were, were factory sealed. The bitch says, can I have change? <laughs> he took up the money and said, excuse me, I'll be right back. He goes to his office, um, opens, opens the, the pilot safe, takes out the exact change in tens and fives. So, so you imagine he comes out with a big five, a, a bag, half full of five and twenties. <laughs> he sets it down on the table. Says, you have a nice day. Well, Ed knew. He was, he, she was fuming then. He, he, he felt her heat coming through the wall of the fucking house. But she didn't do nothing. So, Ed, you know, Ed, Ed drank three or four beers and maybe had maybe two or three bowls of, of sticky pot. And he went to bed and, and thought nothing more about it. So as the main field started to materialize and he started organizing the clutter which had amassed on the original owners, he started, well, okay, that section's ready. I can open that to the general public, but I need a greeter. I need someone to do concessions. So we advertised in the town paper. The fucking bitch shows up for a fucking job. <laughs> and that's... Okay, it's been about six months since he's seen the bitch. And she, she pulls up with the same fucking Audi. <laughs> so, so it's, are uh, you want to play bitch? Fine, we'll play. Of course, he didn't say this to this one. This woman, in my house, on the back wall, there's a wall dedicated to P Proverbs 3110. She says, I'm here, I'm here for a job. And so, so that's his you know, in his head, he's, oh, wait, listen, if this fucking bitch can afford a fucking taxi to take her 486 miles, she don't need shit from Ed. <laughs> but again, Ed didn't give it no thought. He was looking for someone to fill the post. Sarah filled it. He hired her. No problem. So she says, she says, I'll take the job, Mr. Eddington. Fine, you can start tomorrow at, at uh, 8 o'clock when I open. Have a nice day. <laughs> and he <it> left. <laughs> and listen, he had work to do. So he gets, he, he steps on his porch and, and he has his coffee. It's his, it's his tradition at night. But there's an eerie feeling because you've got the lights from the, from the fields coming in. So you've got most of it in shadow. And it's just, it's trippy when you're stoned. <laughs> it really is. And Mr. Eddington was getting stoned that night. So anyway, gets a shadow going across the lights. And I look up, and there's someone up in the, in, in the cheese lady. So it gets up to the cheese lady. And there's flipping Sarah. So this good whore bitch has got one whole fucking display off the shelf and laid up every, every fucking surface. And she's up there and she's polishing. Now mind you, <laughs> mind you, this pissed Ed off totally because there ain't no spots on his shit. So again, Ed kept his cool and said, uh, Bored, couldn't sleep? And she knew he was there. That also pissed him off. But she just kept on polishing. She said, yes, I could not sleep, and I noticed that there was several items that were in the back that would sell if they were to the front, 
As you can see, I have them over there, how I plan to put them back on the shelf. But while the shelf was clear, as you can see, and, and she held up a buffer, which wasn't a cleaning rig, it was a buffer to buff what it had already. So she wasn't cleaning, she was enhancing what it already did. So Ed says, I hope you're not on the clock. She said, no, Mr. Anton, I've been off the clock since 12 o'clock this, this evening. Very well. And then to Mr. Addington, I heard that you have several, you have two bungalows. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. You want one? Follow the instructions on the door. You have a good evening. And again, he just fucking leaves for a third time since the meeting and left her fucking cold. <laughs> so, the relationship, the relationship for the next year and a half was just like that. And with Sear passing, high by high by relationship. Never once did, did he ask her out. Never once did she ask him out. They were always formal. Three three and a half years, they were always formal. Even when they were together, you know, just them. Just you know, they know they, they wanted to fuck each other so badly that, that they that they built so much barrier around them. That, they, that the only way they could do is to speak very civil to one another when they were that close. So she cracks open her beer and she says, uh, Mr. Eddington, um, are you aware that uh, NASCAR is, is in the process of, of building on, uh, an auxiliary racetrack um, uh, down, down in um, Port, where, where was it? Pine Hills Crest or Crest Run, someplace it's like 80 miles um, north of Main Field, and I and he said uh, and he says and this is important because and she says well Mr. Eddington, uh, and NASCAR is is very profitable, and um, I was thinking uh, we could sponsor NASCAR once a month, being that they're going to be so close. I thought about it for a while and he said uh, Fine, have fun, Miss Andesis. And um, he finishes the beer and gets up and leaves the bitch sitting sitting on the So he gets the door and she goes she says Ed First time she used his first name in, in all the time. And what the fuck is your problem? And he turns to back and says, Bitch, what the fuck is yours? And and and, and he turns fist and she turns and they're all, they're now face to face, fist clenched, and well, till this day they both argue who kissed who first. And, and truth be told, in, in Ed's heart of her, hearts, he was goo -ga 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 in love with her ever since the bitch arrived in a fucking taxi three and a half years ago. How they actually became a couple and then got married? Ed cursed himself to this day because it was him that asked her. Because he knew if he waited for the Conor bitch, he would be dead, buried, and old before she would even consider it. And Sarah curses herself because she said so, yes, so quickly. So listen, his wife finally let him race again, and that's what Ed does, he races and is undefeated in the five-quarter track. Well, he's looking to hire a driver, number one. And for four years, thousands of, of dri drivers have, have raced and none of them have impressed him. These other racers, they weren't, they, they didn't want it. So he, he, he gave up on, on looking for a driver that he could sponsor sponsor NASCAR because he has the car. He has the money. 
So he's got, he's got everything. He just needs a fucking driver. And he was frustrated. So finally he gave up. This is about a year now. Out of the blue, Sarah says, So Mr. Eddington, have you given up your search for a driver? He says, not really. I guess I postponed it. Why? Do you know someone of someone, Mrs. Eddington? And she smiles and says, well, it just so happens I do. And she slaps him in a little folder on his chest. What's this, wife? Open it up, husband. And there is a, a glossy of not a Barbie, not a, not a, a babe, but she was pretty. If you look at that picture in one, one word, seriousness. This bitch was serious about her racing. Because this bitch, what Ed did on the East, this bitch has done on the West in half the amount of time. She ran the West Coast and the uh, Northern Western region of stock car circuit and again, was flawless. After, after Sarah read all this shit, she, she fucking called the bitch up. Told her who she was. And told her where to go. A month later, Miranda arrived. Miranda, when she, was, when she arrived in Field 3, she just celebrated her 25th year on the planet. That bed pulls up. Miranda jumps, jumps out. She notices, um, she notices a very stellar woman coming out of the uh, maintenance, maintenance um, shed. And there's no making, you know, they never met each other. Um, but they will, you know, Miranda knew it was Sarah. Sarah says, well, you must be Miranda. So well, they chit chat this and that. Miranda said, would Mr. Eddington be arriving today? Do you have any idea? No, nope. Ed comes when he comes, and, but I'm sure he knows you're here. Everyone knows you're here, sister. And if you're as good as I hope to God you are, I want to make lots of money off of you. <laughs> Ed was facing a, a new driver. He hasn't found this car, but he knew he'd find it when it showed up. Asked the why he ain't there yet. He's not in a rush to meet this woman. Now Ed has spent the whole day walking the lots. And as you know, Ed's got the main field plus three separate lots. Nothing jumped out at him. Nothing said, yeah, okay. So finally, he did, he did something he never ever did. He went back to the Roadrunner. It's a 1969 Roadrunner from Dodge. That it, that it found in a junkyard. And you saw the movie Christine. What that kid did, did, did that, that, that's what Eddie did to that Roadrunner. And he said he even built a car from the wheels up, which means he took a chassis he enlarged the chassis to accommodate a bigger engine, but also he widened the ass end. But it's also air cooled. Number one, number two, it's it's um, it's um, what well, it's supercharger has a supercharger, one of the one of those methane uh, superchargers. The car was quiet that night, which troubled him. But he's set now. He opened the opened the door and sat in the seat and fired her up. He popped the clutch, put her in first, and left the main field. He arrived at field three at four o'clock in the morning. Park where you park if you were gonna take someone on. And he waited. Miranda was sound asleep and just suddenly woke up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and she knew that Mr. Eddington had arrived. But she was not going to be meeting Mr. Eddington tonight. She was going to meet the machine. Now, if you're with us in the beginning, field three was the battle scene of the last battle. Originally, Edwin was going to make it um, a racetrack. Um, but um, I think the reason why he went to the field is he had a lot of war memorabilia stacked around other fields. So he finally said, well, you know what? Let's make it a battle scene and go from there. So field three has the, the remembrance of that battle, which is why field three is still called war. But it's now race war. You've seen the movie, you know, Fast and the Furious, The Race Wars? That's what they had, just identical to that. So he pulls the tarp off and Miranda got weak in the knees. Because standing before her was the sleekest flipping car you ever wanted to see. Miranda opened the door and sat down nightmare she said she's gonna cause nightmares to anyone who's stupid enough to challenge her she got into the nightmare and fired it up she ambled alongside the road runner and eyes faced forward and watched three lights red yellow green you go at the green. But it's the going. It's the going that wins the race. If your car crosses the line when the light is yellow, you are fine. But the track, this track was set up as a switch track. You know, racers get bored of going around in a circle. So on the, on the two straightaways, they put a switch track. And you have to, according to regulations, switch track with the car you're racing. And the car you're racing ain't going to be nice about you letting you pass. So there's been a lot of bumping and and uh, and and, uh, and uh, replacing uh, markers. <laughs> Next thing Randa knew is she's racing down down the circuit track, and the fucking switch is coming, and they're nose to nose. They're nose to nose. Switch track's coming. And they're not yielding. Something has to happen at that switch track or else there's going to be a crash. And what happened at that switch track? Right at the fucking second you have to switch, Ed backed off. And the nightmare shot by. They played cat and mouse for three and a half hours. Miranda had to come in for fuel. Ed still had a half a tank. Ed rolls down the window as she's getting out of the car and says, I think you'll do. See me on the porch at sundown tomorrow. It's like I said, if Ed was to have a daughter, it would be this kid. Ed is confident. He's got a damn good driver. And the ride is flawless because like I said, they built it from the engine block out. Sarah now has become Miranda's business manager. And currently, even if Miranda doesn't win, the end. The fact that she's there, this will be the first female stock car racer to race in the Indy 500. And uh, Mr. Eddington is very pleased with my work 
and I'm looking forward to a long, a very long, and a joyous future with him. And that's all I got to say because the neighbors, I have to be quiet because the neighbors are below me. So you all have a blessed night and uh, we'll see you when we see you. My name is Thomas John William Rowell. I've been established in April 25th, 1980. Good night. Hey, put tears in my eyes. Did big tears in your eyes? Yes. On a scale from one to ten, um, how would you rate it? 